Close your eyes and soak up the smell of an old carpet with the aroma of residual smoke from back when it was legal to smoke indoors in Australia. That is the smell of the video store that I used to work at when I was a teenager. But the smell of the video store I work at right now is absolutely beautiful and heavenly. It is The Last Video Store, and I'm Alexi Toliopoulos, the clerk and host of this show. Each week, I'm joined by a guest that will discuss with me some of their favorite films in the style of an old-school rental combo of one new release, two weeklies, and then I'm going to give them a bespoke, customized recommendation based on their taste. Joining me on the podcast today is one of my dear mates, the funniest fellas in Australia, and a sketch member of the sketch group... Auntie Donna. It is Zachary Ruane. Zachary Ruane is a film buff, just like me, just like you. He loves films, and perhaps if I were to perish or be killed in some kind of horrific accident or on purpose assassination, Zach is probably the person that would take over the show for me. And I think the first suspect you should look at if something like that were to happen. But Zach is so funny. He loves movies. He has got great eclectic taste. We talk about movies all the time. So it's great to finally get one on the record. Finally, we've done a bunch of podcasts together. But great to get one on together in the video store. And I would say this has been very helpful to me. He's helped me make my show with Cameron James, Finding Jesus, which you can check that out. And so much more cool stuff from Auntie Donna as well. And... I'll tell you this, because we're back in the back room, because of that torrential leakage that we had in our main cavernous chamber of the video store, we're stuck in the back room. So he's going to get the back room deal combo one more time, just like our dear mate Tony Armstrong did, where we're going to give him one extra week- weekly pick, okay? One extra weekly pick. So let's dive into our chat with Zachary Ruane from Auntie Donna fame. Yeah, it almost rhymes. Well, it was only a matter of time before one of Australia's great cinephiles would come (laughs) visit me in my outpost here at the last video store. I knew that you were coming today, Zachary Rowain, my dear friend. Hello, thank you for having me. (laughs) I love calling me one of Australia's great cinephiles. Well, it's true. You have a passion for film that rivals my own. No, not that rivals you. I I see myself as a Padawan to you, the master. I, I see myself as a as a but a dark padawan like Whoa, you're like mr maul yeah yeah i'm mr maul and <laughs> you're palpatine i'm dr sidious <laughs> <laughs> well my padawan allow me to ignite my saber and lop off that lovely braid dangling down your side oh, wow. and offer you the honor of ascending to cinephile night oh thank you so much sir thank you i i but i I do not grant you the rank of master (laughs) (laughs) i sit at the end of a table with you and aaron mccann at the center (laughs) another dear cinephilic friend of ours one day he shall grace these this well, we're in the back room today, so yeah, yeah. Right, yeah he, we fair. will never allow him in the actual store. He shall remain in the back room with us. <laughs> do you get um? Do you get? Uh, uh, sorry to go off topic mm-hmm. of immediately. Course, yes, yes. But go do you get? My, I used to work at a video store for mm-hmm. a very short run, and we would get um preview DVDs and preview videos. Yeah, where they'd go black and white every ten minutes, so oh, that you couldn't gosh. pirate them. Do you get them here? We get them here, yeah, and cool. my favorite one that I've ever gotten was that is how I saw Paranormal Activity. Great. And let me tell you, it made it feel all the more real, and it's one of the most scary movie experiences I've ever had. <laughs> it's like I watched, do you remember that movie that was set, it was like an internet, it was about a, a, a snuff, like they were doing a live stream internet snuff mm. thing. It was from the early 2000s and it opened with the, uh, with the whole... Remember the internet sound? Mm. There was this mode movie. them buckling up. Yeah. Should we try it? And it was... <laughs> and that was the opening sound. Mm. And 
it was one of those things that a very small amount of people, it was horrifying. Mm -hmm. Using that as an opening sound for horror was horrifying, but only I get it and I couldn't show it to someone Mm. under... yeah, 25. you're the only guy that has that reference. You, me, <laughs> maybe people in their 40s. Heck, maybe even a fella named Dupree. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to sign you up to the store. Oh, great. I'm going to need to see a piece of ID. And I'm noticing you've got a little badge on your chest there. Yes, I do. I've got two little badges. These are two emblems and they're familiar to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you notice you can recognize who they are. You see who they okay, are. Okay, I'm seeing a guy. Okay, one is a... It's, I believe it's Mark Mitchell, and he's got kind of flattened brown hair with a little whips to the side, yeah. and these big old glasses. I'm thinking this is a guy, mm, Mr. Fish. <laughs> <laughs> this is Mark Mitchell right here, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um, <laughs> And the other guy's the unmistakable Mr. Gribble. <laughs> Also played by Mark Mitchell. Yeah, we got we got Mark Mitchell. We got a couple of Mark Mitchells right wow, here. Okay. Yeah. Um, hey, and check out this badge. I've got my own Mark Mitchell badge. <laughs> yeah, congratulations. <laughs> What's your Mark Mitchell badge? Oh well, you know, if you look on one side, it says a beautiful couple of days, <laughs> and then on the other side, a happy. <laughs> That's how you know you're a real Greek. Yeah. You get a, you when get you get a Mark Mitchell, badge. you get a Mark Mitchell badge when you're a Greek in comedy. But you also get a couple of Mark Mitchell badges when you ascend the ranks of comedian and head into the realm of comedian turned villain in children's TV show. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. This is a, this is a great honor. I um so I uh, in th- I, I went to acting school and in third oh year acting gosh. school, Alexi, that's a class that they ran. <laughs> yeah, we're all fucked in the head. <laughs> what you're trying to say and in third year acting school i described myself as a character actor Mm -hmm. we were all talking about like future career opportunities and i said well as a character actor and i had two friends of mine they thought that was so funny that i considered (laughs) myself a character actor it's like you in that moment you're 19 and then as soon as you finish a sentence like oh no i'm 40 (laughs) bald i became burnt young in that moment Well, that's, I was like, I'm not going to get work until I'm 40 and bald. Yeah, yeah. I was aware I've got to fill the next 20 years. <laughs> I just was very conscious of that's who I was. But they thought it was so funny for someone at 19 to consider themselves a character actor. <laughs> so it has been my life goal to have a published article describing me as a character actor. And I'm going to... I haven't talked to one of these guys in maybe 10 years. Mm-hmm. But I intend on finding out where he lives and sending him a cutout of that article. <laughs> So it's been my life goal yeah. to be defined as a character actor. You were voted most likely to play a character witness in a courtroom <laughs> drama. I'm going to be number two or three on, a, on an episode of Law and Order. That's on the <laughs> list as well. But in this one, you're playing the villain in yeah. a kid's show, which is just like, that's a bit of a dream come true, right? It's huge. For a character actor it's, like yourself. <laughs> it's the, uh, it's, this is the, these are the badges, right? Mm-hmm. This is about earning the character actor mm-hmm. rank. I've got to get five of these oh, wow. to become a, an Australian character actor. <laughs> um, and my agent told me it's too hard to get into a Mad Max film. Mm-hmm. So I'm working on the other ones you right now. You're going to work on the other ones. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I the tradition played, of Mr. Gribble in Around the Twist, of Mr. Fish in Lift Off. I played Mr. Chantel <laughs> in Planet Lulin. And and better than that, I'm not the villain. The villain is an alien from mm-hmm. outer space. I'm just the uptight, the uptight teacher that kind of gets in their way a little bit, but more than that, just says exposition a lot. I'm the oh. and that's the dream. Wow. Like really, I'm not the villain. Mm-hmm. I'm not Really, a you're ma- not antagonistic, perhaps. Oh, yeah, but I'm a mm. bit of a I'm a bit of a prick. Although it wasn't really written, I wasn't written as much as a prick <laughs> as I play it. You're like, hey, fuck! I've got a dream that I need to live here. <laughs> they wrote this like interesting kind of guy that's really excited about science, and I just came. I'm like, Whoa! I tried to get as many face wobbles in as possible. And from day one, I was like, I'm gonna see how many times I can wobble my jowls. <laughs> Hey, I inherited these jowls. <laughs> I need to wobble them. And I was and the best part was I was the only adult for a lot of my scenes, so I didn't work opposite any of the other adults mm-hmm. for a really long time. So I just spent weeks of the shoot just being like, here I am wobbling my jowls. Mm-hmm. It's like I hope the other adults are pitching their performance here because this could be one of the most embarrassing <laughs> things I've ever done in my life. I'm just pitching this at mid nineties. <laughs> Yeah. Like jowl wobbling. Yeah. Meanwhile, Lisa McCune's yeah. playing it straight. Oh, like. God. We got Richard Nixon impersonator here. <laughs> well, you know, this ID's checking out. I'm putting it through my system. 
all systems are go, brother. Oh, great. So you are now welcome to oh, thank put you. your little rental combo together. Your yeah. new renters combo. You can get a new release, a handful of weeklies. I'm going to send you out to search those shelves. Wow. Come back with your bounty and we shall discuss your combo. And then do we play it? Like, do we? Do I have to act out the walking You around? have to walk around. You have to select <laughs> your choices. Do I have to like mm. walk past the adult section and glance at yeah. it, but not really And then slowly it. lean forward a little bit <laughs> to conceal a hardening penis <laughs> as you wander the rest of the shelves. Oh, mm, lots of good options. <laughs> oh, interesting. Where's your Pamela Anderson oh. section? Oh, oh wow. Jesus. Very good. Very good. Um, oh, where's your comedy section? Oh, here, here they are. Oh, awesome. My favorite comedy. Porkies. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. I love a, a raunchy teen film. <laughs> well, I'm going to say this. Choose wisely, sir, because at the end of your combo... Your little bonus, oh. the staff pick recommendation, my bespoke choice based on your taste. So be honest, be earnest, and be sincere, baby. Oh, wow. I love this. This is beautiful. <laughs> New release. Um, okay, I've got them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you've got this beautiful stack here sitting neatly on top it's a new release and i'm gonna tell you this this is also one of my very favorite movies in the last few years yeah yeah you recommended it to me you recommended it to me and i forgot that you recommended it and then i watched it and then i went back over your recommendations and i was like oh great wow what a shame you forgot one of the most significant moments of your life (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> no, but it was good because then I went into it with less expectations. Mm-hmm. I went into watching it um, not being like, this is Alexi's pick of the fest. Mm-hmm. I remember when, literally, I remember when I saw it, we hung out at the, the start of the day. We're talking about the movie May, December. Yeah. Drama. By Todd Haynes. Yeah. And we were hanging out together. You were in Sydney Film Festival one day. Mm. Fly in, fly out. Yeah, yeah. I had a real crazy... And that's when you ascended to (laughs) knighthood. In that day, I was like, God, we got another one amongst our ranks. (laughs) He's a man flying to Sydney to watch films he can watch in two months' time. (laughs) But I remember that afternoon, I was like, come on, just extend your stay. Come see May, December with me. Come see May, December. And then you finally caught up with her. What are your immediate thoughts about May, December? Um, I just, I just, I loved it so much. It's hard to describe. I was hoping to rewatch it Mm. because I watched it at uh, Melbourne, the Melbourne Film Festival. So that was now Mm. a few months ago. A few months ago. And it's got, the way I describe it's like a delicious premise. Yeah. Delicious yeah. premise. And it's something I loved so much about it is I think we've lived, we've we've reassessed a lot of things in the last 10 mm-hmm. years about how we responsibly tell stories about certain things, mm-hmm. right? And so we've been going through a very careful period of time, I think, in filmmaking. And what I love about this film is I think it's very responsibly told mm-hmm. and it's very ethically told, but it's funny and it's dark and mm-hmm. it's messy and it's interesting. It's everything I want out of a film like this, but I don't feel gross at the end of it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like, there's like the undercurrent of grossness that every now and then it comes through to you. But I think the way that you're like the way you're saying it's almost like the way that's presented because yeah. it's it's also about like cultures how culture grapples with these things. Yeah. So if you're not familiar with May, December, it is just like I said, just a delicious, delicious premise. 20 years after a notorious tabloid romance grips the entire nation. It's one of those things where you hear about those stories of an older woman who has started an extremely illicit romance with a minor, a younger man, they have become a married couple in the years since. And now Natalie Portman plays an actress going to live with them, to study them, to turn it into a performance for a film. Yeah. And I think like that when I heard that premise, especially for Todd Haynes, who's so known for uh, like taking melodrama from mm. the Douglas Sirk era of the 1950s, stuff like All That Heaven Allows, and then transforming those things to be either modernized versions of them 
or like in a contemporary setting like this one is or presenting those with kind of modern contemporary attitudes but still in the 1950s like carol and stuff yeah, yeah. and i think this is just like the perfect evolution to be about that kind of stuff it just feels like a director you know there's that amazing thing that happens it happens with with uh this is a this is a weird divergent but it's like something no, i always on me no divergent <laughs> mate <laughs> Something I've always thought when I was when I was a, like a starting out as a comedian is when I think when you first start out as a comedian, you can't make something funny mm -hmm. if the core idea isn't funny. Mm. You don't know it like the core has to be funny, or, but you can't. And then you'd look at these older comedians, these more experienced ones that have such a command of their form that they can take any idea that they want to talk about and they can make it funny. They can just go, I'm going to talk about this thing and I'm going to make it funny for the audience. And that point in a comedian's career is something I've always aspired to get to. And I think that that this feels like the filmmaking equivalent of that. Mm. It just feels like this is a director who... It's a first-time writer, I think. First-time writer. Which is amazing. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very bold and strong screenplay. Yeah, yeah. Oscar-nominated screenplay. Deservedly so. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But it we just, give it a nod. <laughs> it just feels like a filmmaker that is just using all of the tools in his tool mm. belt and doing it amazingly. Like, it's so funny and it's so murky like you never mm. quite know who you're meant to be on the side of it's just such a good film and the kind of way they would describe that atmosphere is something that he creates within moments like mm. as soon as the film starts you start having this kind of like this intoxicating atmosphere that feels like a hazily remembered mm. like afternoon telemovie that you would have seen on cable when maybe you're homesick or you're home bored on the weekend <laughs> as a kid or a teenager and you're just going like what is this and because of that it kind of awakens that tabloid camp yeah. of May December as well like the camp Ness is it's weird because maybe it's not overt straight away, but as soon as you get into it or as soon as you notice that kind of camp kitschy quality, it becomes the overwhelming feeling of the film as well and where the kind of humor comes out. I mean, like the first line is, I don't think we have enough hot dogs. <laughs> yes. And you just go, I give you lock it on from there. You're like, you're in. And not only that, it's, we, I don't think we have enough hot dogs. It has a zoom with it and it has like the most phenomenal mm. music. It, it's played like the most dramatic moment imaginable. Yeah. And, and it uses the score from the go between, mm. which is like a classic 70s era English film that is kind of a bit more about that. Oh, how do you say it? Like that, the simmer of like a romance, like yeah. not being overt, but it uses that score, ooh, just to like kind of amp up that high camp perfection and yeah. add a little bit of depth to it as well. Yeah, totally. And it has just the whole. I think something I loved about it that I really loved about it is there's this sort of there's this assumption that it knows its audience is smart enough to know. Mm -hmm. It, it doesn't have to tell us that, that that certain acts that are depicted in this film or that uh, this film is about are bad things to do. Mm -hmm. There's no like, it's like, we all know that's bad. Now let's dig into the characters. Mm -hmm. There's just such a great, um, just confidence, I think. I loved it. I thought it was so good. And I loved it. It's why I really wanted to rewatch it before I came mm -hmm. here, but I didn't get the chance because I think it's the sort of film that's going to continue to reveal itself every time I watch mm -hmm. it. That's the best part. Ooh, for the best kind of movie. And those three lead performances, Natalie Portman, Julianne Moore, oh. that amazing list that yeah. goes in and out. And that's why I want to watch it again. <laughs> and Charles Melton, incredible young performance from a younger actor. Amazing Breakthrough. Yeah. Breakthrough. Yeah. Breakthrough Breakthrough alert <laughs> You got the breakthrough button <laughs> Uh oh Cinephiles At your ready There's a breakthrough performance By a young actor <laughs> Show your support Show your support He put on weight for the role Punchy <laughs> <Auntie> mama <laughs> We're gonna get into your weeklies Before we do I have to ask you another yeah. question It's something you kind of Hinted that earlier have you ever been a member of another video store before? Yeah, I used to work. I used to work Ooh. at a Video Easy. Wow, uh, a member of the tribe. I worked there for six months. Whoa, which Video Easy? Uh, video Easy in the Latrobe Valley uh, in Morwell, where I grew up. Wow, my and, gosh, uh, this sounds like a fantasy realm. It was a real dream job, but then I got off. Well, you know, 
a real dream job, but small business manager. So that wasn't the funnest thing. <laughs> I remember at one point I went on holiday with my family because I was 14. And then she was like, you can't go on a holiday when you promised you're going to be available over the break. I'm like, what was I meant to do? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what you're meant to do. I dedicated myself. <laughs> I said, this is my first priority in this life, and it's an allegiance I swore. Yeah, that's amazing. I no. took the blood oath. Well, my big problem was I then got offered a job at the cinema. Oh, gosh. And that was, uh, that was you know, that's equal dream job right there. Mm-hmm. So I, I took the dream job at the cinema. I left the dream job at the video mm-hmm. store. I took the dream job at the cinema. On some levels, I regret it, though, because yes. cinemas are only the movies that are out right now. You it's don't get to play... A lack of history. Yeah, you don't get to play with the recommendations. That mm-hmm. was always my favourite thing to mm-hmm. do. So I think I would have learned a lot more at that video shop. Well, it was my greatest film school. Yeah. And that's someone who went to film school for four years. <laughs> the video store was still my greatest film school. <laughs> It would have been amazing. That would have been great. But also at the video store, pods were a new thing when I was working there. Remember <gasps> pods? How and, could I uh, forget? I still have a pod-based diet. <laughs> it's all pods. It's a Snickers flavor in case in a wafer cup. And this is the thing, you know, everyone remembers video stores. I'm looking at your fairy floss right here <laughs> and it's $85 for a bag. A packet of chips, ninety dollars. Yeah, well, they're vintage. These are vintage fairy flosses. I don't know. I think you're doing a bit of a markup, man. Crystallize when you open them up. (laughs) It's like a little crystal of fairy (laughs) floss. But for some reason, for the first month of those pods being available, uh, our our manager didn't realize how much of a markup she should she could do, and she was charging the same as a Coles or a Woolworths. Oh my gosh! And I was just munching on those pods (laughs) twenty (laughs) four seven. Much it on those pods while an ad for Sideways played on the on the wow, TV screen. I don't want any fucking Snickers pods. <laughs> weekly. All right, your first weekly. It's an Australian treasure. Mm. One of my all-time favorite Australian films from the master, the Hitchcock acolyte himself, Richard Franklin. It's a road game. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I love road games. And if you're not familiar with road games, it is affectionately known as Rear View Window. Because hey, great, love that. Isn't that beautiful? Because yeah. it's basically Hitchcock's Rear Window as told going through the Nullabar on along the highway. And uh, Stacey Keach, great American actor, he witnesses a murder happening. Mm. And he's basically on the road tracking this murderer or trying to escape this murderer the way that Rewindo plays out. Also stars the lovely Jamie Lee Curtis and one of my personal heroes, Grant Page as the villain. Yeah. Australia's greatest stuntman. There you go. Mm-hmm. There you go. Yeah, no, I... I... I this is a relatively recent discovery. I only watched this film in the last couple of years and it was one of those moments where I was like here's this incredible Australian here's this incredible genre film full mm. stop removed from removed from Australia. Mm-hmm. Here's this incredible genre film with you know Jamie Lee Curtis is the most famous genre actress mm-hmm. there is. Yeah. She's a scream queen. It's official. It's official. She's <laughs> n- close to one of the OG. She's at least scream queen uh, royalty. Exactly. She's in the dynasty. She's Her a- mother, of course, <laughs> Janet Lee, the star of Psycho. And uh, Halloween H2O for a scene or oh, two. Oh, and when they pop in that scene together, what is that riff I detect <laughs> playing? Is it the theme of Psycho interpreted through Halloween's theme? <laughs> I didn't realize it was her when I was watching <laughs> Halloween like, H2O the first time. <laughs> And then the theme played. I'm like, oh, that must be her. <laughs> Hang on a second. They must be parents. And so <laughs> oh, okay. Um, but I remember just being shocked that this film wasn't more well known. Mm. That this isn't talked about in the... It is within, within film fan communities. It's, you know, it's definitely... I'd say it's definitely on the cusp of being a true cult film. Yeah, yeah. But it just... I think what blew my mind was two things. One, that that it, it's not in the conversation the way that a picnic at Hanging Rock mm-hmm. is. And two, that when it is, it's lumped into Ozploitation. And it's kind of like, I love Ozploitation. Yeah. It's an area of study and love for me. And it's kind of on the cusp of like, 
not quite Australian New Wave. It's not really quite an Ozploitation movie. No, but it, it's it sits a like I, I rate I I care about Ozploitation films, so I'm not denigrating those no, by no, saying no. this. But it sits kind of a little bit above those. It's a, certainly the it's it's closer to a John Carpenter than mm-hmm. a than a you know than a Felicity sexy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I don't think that's denigrating the yeah. sexploitation. We love Felicity. We love Alvin Purple. We love his penis. <laughs> Yeah. Don't get me wrong, but it, it's it's a really well told, like visually, mm-hmm. like a visual feast. It really you might is, say. and because it's like capturing that outback, like the desert landscape. But what I really love about it, and I think it's like actually what the secret recipe is for this, because you know a lot of the Hitchcock acolytes, like the Palmo or someone, I, I also one of my heroes. Uh, all those grubs. I love all the grubs that love Hitchcock. <laughs> but uh, there is an understanding to like what the secret source of Rear yeah. Window is, where it's not just the tension, it's not just the thrills. But in Rear Window, when you're looking out that window, you're kind of getting the little glimpses into people's lives, the neighbors. Yeah, you see like yeah. scenes where like, oh, there's a couple going through a breakup or like there's a, you know, you see like people's lives. And I think that Franklin really understands that because across the road, he's able to interpret that feeling of like when you're on the road in Australia, which we all experience in a some kind of form of like a summer holiday type thing, especially when you're a kid and you've just got your eyes out on the road and there's all these people that you're sharing the road with. Yeah, they yeah. become your neighbors over like the six hour trip that you're on. Yeah. You start noticing the familiar people. You start going, oh, what's their story there? And I think he captures that those vi- in vignettes really, really well. A hundred percent. It's like, um, uh, <laughs> I don't know why I'm thinking of uh, Batman versus Superman right oh, now. Oh, well, it's always running through your brain yeah. after a cause. <laughs> you share a name with Mr. Snyder, the two Zacharys, if you will. Mr. Snides. But I, re- I remember with Batman versus Superman, the amount of iconography and imagery he mm. took from the comic books, but without... There didn't seem to be like a core reason for including mm. it. There didn't seem to be that core like um, transference of the ideas. I think you're so right. This this not only does it capture what's great about Rear Window, it really does put it in a setting that that is fitting for it. It's not just it. It absolutely makes sense. You don't have to have seen Rear Window to appreciate this film. Absolutely. I just thought it was so cool. And I also the other thing I really love about it, and this is something I can go on about if I'm not careful, but I just think there's something about... Can I give you something to say? Yeah. Throw caution to the wind, (laughs) baby. There's no need to be careful. (laughs) No, I just, I had this moment on the, I I did a screening of it Mm. uh, and and watching it on the big screen, it's so fun and Mm. thrilling. And I had this thing where I thought to myself, when, if I were to really try to capture what Australia does best, Mm -hmm. what, what the majority of our output does best i think there's something about like we really push taste in Mm -hmm. a really cool way we really push against what is considered tasteful and we make choices that maybe aren't the right choice but but they provoke and they're interesting and if you really look at it that's across the board i think Mm. like you know it's um the comedy that we do is often the the comedy that does well overseas is stuff that is a little bit off kilter, off kilter, yeah. and and not for everyone. And I would say, especially for people like in our generation, it's probably like that surrealist touch that a lot of like the stuff that we grew up on in Australia. It is like surreal comedy, like Round the Twist, like Lift Off, like Your Hero, Mark Mitchell, <laughs> like Mark Mitchell, <laughs> absolutely. You know, and then you look at even Mad Max, and mm. but it also it goes our biggest export whatever you think of him would be would probably be Baz Luhrmann Mm. and Baz Luhrmann is the the number one reason I think he's controversial as a filmmaker in terms of people liking him or not too restrained (laughs) too restrained (laughs) (laughs) and I just I had this real moment where I just thought everything that really cuts through Mm -hmm. pushes against taste risks being bad in order to be brilliant and yet so often when we look back at the stuff we've made, when we uh, look, when a lot of the funding bodies give money to the things mm-hmm. that are going to get made, it's, 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 there's this like hunt for niceness and, mm. and it's just like, that's never the thing that we've done wonderfully. That's never the thing we've done well. 
and uh, it, it always takes someone overseas or or something overseas to tell us that that that, that, that things are good. Mm. And I just think we need to embrace the fact that the best stuff we do pushes against taste a little bit. Yeah. And I think this film really captures that for me. That's beautifully put. Consider me moved. <laughs> Even though it sounds like I wasn't, I am. But I'm trying to save time. Sounds like someone who is, it sounds like someone who does a, a weird who's in a weird sketch group making a <laughs> trying to put himself into a canopy. <laughs> That's what it sounds like. <laughs> I'll give a couple of shout outs before we move on. Everett DeRoche, uh, the screenwriter mm. of Road Games. He made a few other classics in that Ozploitation era. Long Weekend. He wrote Long Weekend, which is a great trans- horror film that is the epitome of what transgression means in horror. <laughs> then you've got Razorback, Jaws with a Giant Pig. Patrick, another collaboration with Richard Franklin and a film that I really love that's a bit underrated and underseen, Fortress from 1985 starring Rachel Ward. But in that conversation of Richard Franklin, he is like a real acolyte of Hitchcock. He invited Hitchcock to speak at his film school and he came. He had conversations with him a lot over the years and he directed Psycho 2. Yeah, great which film. I think is one of the best sequels ever made. Yeah, 100%. And no one knows about it at all. No, no. Other films that he made, he made Patrick, which is basically... Psycho, he does, <laughs> which is his take on Psycho. Road Games is his take on Rear Window. And then the next kind of famous movie that he's made is a children's adventure movie called Cloak and Dagger, starring Dabney Coleman and Henry Thomas, uh, which is a, like a spy kind of thriller. And yeah. I remember watching it and before going into it, I go like, I wonder what Hitchcock film this is. And within a few minutes ago, oh, it's North by Northwest. <laughs> he is, I, I absolutely adore Richard Franklin. He passed away a little young. Yeah. And I kind of wish we got to see more of his films. Kind and of I- wish. I'm going to say... I definitely wish. I definitely wish. Yeah. And I, I, I wish he, like, I think that the tides were turning and he was being appreciated more, mm-hmm. but I think it would have been nice for him to see because I think people are really starting to get on board with mm-hmm. how great he was. Oof. Oof. Absolutely. Zach, I did notice you loitering around the comedy section. Well, I'm a comedy boy, Alexi, and I think it would be uh, silly not to pick a comedy. And that's interesting because I often say comedy is the silliest genre. Uh, It's up there. It's definitely up there. Uh, I think it's possibly the silliest genre. Mm. Um, I'm trying to think of a sillier genre, you know, as a joke, but I really can't mm. think of anything silly. Circus but... features. Yeah, uh... yeah, maybe, maybe some children's films, but yeah. most of them are comedies just it's for true. kids, you know. That is true. Yeah, uh, but it's a wonderful film. Yeah, should I say it? Please say the words out loud. I- I've got Zoolander here. Comedy. By director Benjamin Stiller. Benjamin Stiller's <laughs> Zoolander. That's how it should have been credited. Ben was this Stiller's a formative Zoolander. film for you? In, as far as no, your I only saw it last goes? week. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm having a heart palpitation. <laughs> We're going to need to call an ambulance in here. <laughs> my breath has escaped my body. <laughs> no, this is like the formative comedy. Like oh. this... I think this, along with McAuliffe Program, Mm -hmm. are like the two most formative things. Mm. Yeah, I love this film. I think what's really exciting about Zoolander is it's a comedy with a really unique personality. And a lot of that takes form in the world building around the characters because it's a great film because it goes, okay, what's a niche that we can explore and really reverberate comedically with? And it's going, okay, male models. And... I think Ben Stiller is great director, great performer, great writer, hunk, beautiful, charming, <laughs> sexy, the whole package to make a male model comedy. <laughs> I rewatched it recently and the bit where he goes down into the mine, mm-hmm. it's just like, this guy is ripped. <laughs> this guy is like ripped. And I get it because he's playing a model, mm-hmm. but it's like, he has no right to be this funny. Mm. <laughs> This man has no right to be this funny, this beautiful man. But no, he has to believably look like a male model, doesn't mm-hmm. he? I love it. I think it's it's a really well-structured film. It's mm. nearly perfectly structured as a film. It's, yeah. it's tight. It tells the story. It's Everything comes from story. It's just so funny. The one bit I don't like is the stiffy bit. Oh, when the stiffy's getting whacked in a, in a massage table? You know, uh, I just reckon that tips it over the edge. Mm. But other than that, a perfect movie, I think. I remember that's uh, <laughs> one of the earliest times I remember seeing this movie. It must have been the first. 
I was coming home from school. I saw that it was on like movie extra or whatever the cable channel was. They would play this. I'm like, oh great, I'm going to watch it. And so I'm watching with my yaya, my yeah, grandmother. Right. She's sitting down with me. She's laughing. And the scene that she laughed the most at, <laughs> that I did not laugh very much at all during, was the Stevie <laughs> avoiding being slapped. It's just got this. It's so funny because the whole movie is pitched at a certain level mm -hmm. and suddenly it's got a dancing stiffy it's got uh, a, a, a man in drag mm -hmm. and like extreme prosthetics that looks like prosthetics it's just <laughs> like this is from a different film <laughs> and also i love in this film the like employment of john voight as like a dramatic actor oh, playing yeah. his father due to friedlander and vince vaughn playing his weird brothers i think just casting that out just outside of comedy like Vince yeah. Vaughn he's very funny man but casting that slightly outside of comedy adds gravitas to it and then John Voight doing a real performance with touches of comedy yeah. is a great stroke when I think about it and when, when I'm, I'm doing that great stroke that boner ain't <laughs> wavering away <laughs> <laughs> when I think about it I think like that's it's there's so many things in that film that have influenced mm -hmm. my comedy, but that's such a great reference. There is nothing I love more than like uh, clunky writing, writing mm -hmm. that doesn't quite work, and then getting a good actor to deliver it the best they can. That's why you and I link up. <laughs> that's it, because I think that's I know you know we both have a love for exposition yeah, and like yeah. really telling exposition and stuff. <laughs> that's why I love fantasy movies. You're more dead to me than than your dead mother. <laughs> getting John Voight to say you're more dead to me than my dead mother than your dead mother is just comedy gold. Like, uh, it's a beautiful cast. Owen Wilson and Stiller together, so funny. Christine oh, yeah. Taylor is like the perfect straight man throughout. Yeah. And David Duchovny's <laughs> cameo. Oh, come on, come on, come on. The cool story Hansel is incredible mm -hmm. as well. It's just a perfect movie. It's so funny. And I think that use of relax, Frankie Goes to Hollywood. Yeah. There's something about that where it's like, do you think that's like the perfect song for this? 100%. <laughs> Everything's perfect. Everything's perfect. The tiny little phone, the fact he can't turn left. <laughs> it's just like, it's just filled with great jokes. And they're all like, they're all so perfectly within the structure mm -hmm. of it. And it's that, it's the thing for me that I love the most about that movie is every line that everyone remembers and quotes, mm -hmm. there's another one, two or three lines after it that mm -hmm. would have been just like, if that, yeah. if they, they could have fucking heard it, if they weren't laughing yeah, so hard. Legitimately. Yeah. Like for me, everyone talks about what is this? A center for ants. Mm -hmm. It needs to be at least three times bigger. But my favorite bit in the entire movie is Will Farrell's response, which is he's absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> The way he plays it, just this pitch of like, I'll give this man whatever he wants. But the knowledge that that's the stupidest thing he's ever heard. It's, I think, the greatest moment in Will Ferrell's career. It's the best line in the whole movie. And mm -hmm. no one thinks about it because it comes after one of the most iconic comedy lines of all time. It's just an incredible film. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, your final pick. Mm. It's a classic mm. from the twisted mind hidden behind one of filmmaking's greatest great quiffs. This side of Jim Jarmusch, we're talking David Lynch, his classic Hollywood epic Mulholland Drive. Cult. Yeah. How do we dare talk about this in such a short time it's frame? Like the, it's one of the movies, isn't it? It's Truly. Like, it's like one of the movies. The films, the movies, the cinema. When did this film come into your life for the first time? So I watched this film when it was a new release. And I was way too young for it. Okay. I watched it when I was... It, it, it came out in 01. So I would have watched it in 02 probably mm -hmm. when I was 12 years 12 old. 12 years old. I watched it with my family. Oh and they made gosh. me close my eyes and block my ears during the rude bits. Wow. Let me tell you this. My father loved this movie and my stepmom and they were very scared of it. They bought it on DVD. I'm going through their shelves, pull one out and go, excuse me, what's this R18 for sexualized nudity? <laughs> I think I'm going to put this one on <laughs> around the same up. time. Let's watch this. <laughs> so I, I watched it in the absolute privacy underneath the doona. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so you, I love this idea that it would have been on second and third viewing that I mm-hmm. discovered how horny of a movie it was, <laughs> and you discovered how beautiful and sad of a movie it was. Because you would have just been like, boom. Well, I tell you, David Lynch played it very well for a twelve-year-old me because he demanded there be no skip function on this DVD. Yeah. You have to watch it all. So to get to those moments of sexualized nudity, I was exposed to many thoughts I was not ready for. <laughs> <laughs> I put this movie. I so that I put the the the, the vivid memory I mm. have is we watched it as a family. I had mm. to close my eyes during the horny bits, mm-hmm. and then we went for a walk afterwards. And my dad hated it. He mm. hated it because the ending didn't make any sense, and it doesn't. Well, it does, but mm. yeah, I I tell you when I watched it a couple of years ago. It all clicked because yeah. it's a film that I've watched many times in my life, almost once every two years. Yeah. And the last time I watched it was a time that it all oddly clicked for me. Yeah. Where you re- you kind of understand the movie as two halves. To me, there's no ambiguity to the ending anymore. No. And the surrealism all makes sense, especially when it's in this era of modern American surrealism, that mm. turn of the millennium, as I like to call it, the millennium mindfuck era of yes, filmmaking. Yes. And it is different to a lot of those because a lot of those are a really complex idea distilled down to and using surrealism to distill it down to like a, an image that is understandable or a feeling. I think this is almost the inverse where it is a rather simple story yeah. and a familiar Hollywood story then instead of the steel that's expanded to be about the feeling, to be expanded about the notions of character and who you are and identity, it's complicated rather than distilled down it, there's this in the through, telling of it all. Through abstraction, mm-hmm. you can appreciate an old story anew. Because that it's mm-hmm. true. It's it's when I actually think about what the story is. There's there's so many stories like that. Mm-hmm. It's a and story of a dorky lady, a <laughs> dorky Diane, as I like to call a her. Dorky Diane. Mm-hmm. You know the idea that Hollywood corrupts. Like we've mm-hmm. seen that so many times. But but when you watch it like this, you there's this layer. Like I think in the way that comedy, you if if you only go serious, if you don't have comedy in something. Uh, you don't open up your heart. Mm-hmm. So you're more likely to feel, I think, if there's something that lets helps you let it in. And this is the same thing. It's such a... It's a story that's been told so many times. It's really e- hard to connect with what's saying. But by abstracting it, mm-hmm. it's it's so much more beautiful. And, I mean, I think that's the other thing about, about Lynch is people love to talk about how weird he is. I think the two things people forget is, one, how funny he is. Mm. This movie's a very funny film. This, the espresso scene is <laughs> very, very funny. Mm. And also, almost all of his films are, have a very tragic human element to them. Mm. You know, that, that's the thing I, I think people forget is he really, really cares about his characters and, and you feel for his characters, mm. you know, even though they go through some horrible shit, you're not meant to be like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> I just think it's such a beautiful film. Yeah. And I also think I watched it at such a perfect time. I think it was this Donnie Darko. Oh my gosh. Wow. <laughs> a man was birthed into this world in those moments. <laughs> and uh, Evangel- like Neon mm. Genesis Evangelion. Those three things... At exactly the point where I was deciding what story was or what film and television mm-hmm. was, I saw those films at exactly the time where I could. It was a way of saying, "Hey, it doesn't have to make sense all at once." Mm. And I think because of that, I'm now much more chill with everything. <laughs> <laughs> I can go and watch Titan and be like, "I'll give this one a day." <laughs> I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna make any snap judgments right now. <laughs> And I, th- I can thank Mulholland Drive for that, you know? Oh, well, spoken about beautifully, Zachary, you truly have ascended to the <laughs> rank of master. Well, I hope so, Alexi. <laughs> I hope so. I'm there aren't people listening to this going, what's mm. this doofus on about? No, you are now on the Cinephile Council. <laughs> Me, you, a little green bald guy with huge ears, <laughs> we're all together on the council. <laughs> And to signify that, I'm going to bestow upon you a gift of my recommendation. As I was putting these films into my 
algorithm of my brain, the Alexa algorithm, if you will. Oh yeah, great. Which, I will. Mm, no, I think I won't. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's a that's a keeper right oh, there. Oh god, that's the keeper. I was really like going, where do I start here? And because Rogue Games was an exciting pick for me of the ones you chose. Yeah. I was like, okay, why don't we think about like the other children of Hitchcock, the other acolytes out there. I love the rear window of that. And immediately as I started thinking about that, okay, there's another great wee window uh, slash vertigo resurgence film, a film that uses those as a backbone to tell another really whack weed genre story. And then I started populating the other ingredients in there. I wanted a little bit of like, I guess Mulholland Drive's also vertigo nature, a little bit of that, that kind of, Mm, how do I say it? Like the perversion of mm. uh, Mulholland Drive that's in there. A little bit of the leery quality of May, December and kind of like the campness around those. And I started thinking, okay, what about Zoolander? Hmm. What if there was a movie that had all of those elements, including it being a Hollywood story, a story set in Hollywood Are in the backgrounds me? of acting and movie making? And what if in if there was just a film that had all of those things together and also had a three-minute music video sequence dedicated to Relax by Frankie Goes to Hollywood in it? And I thought, hang on a tick, brother. There's one movie that has every single one of those elements all together, and it is by the grub master himself, the other Hitchcock acolyte, Mr. Brian De Palma. <sighs> Who I know is an actor, director whose filmography you want to explore. Yeah. And the movie is his film, Body Double. Thriller. Oh, a film I haven't seen. I was hoping it was one I hadn't seen. Starring Melanie Griffith. Oh, and amazing. it truly does have a music video that he directed of Relax. Frankie Goes to Hollywood, the song from Zoolander, in it. He directs an entire music video sequence in there. Body Double is about an actor who loses an acting role and his girlfriend. And the actor's name, Jake Scully, not to be confused with Jake Sully from <laughs> Avatar. He finally catches a break. He gets offered a gig house sitting in the Hollywood Hills. While peering through the beautiful home telescope one night, he spies a gorgeous blonde dancing in her window. But when he witnesses the girl's murder, it leads Scully through the netherworld of adult entertainment industry on a search for answers. With porn actress played by Melanie Griffith wow. as her, her body double as his guide. This is truly an amazing choice, Alexi. Yeah, I kind of lost my fucking mind when I put it all together. I felt a surge of energy quivering through my bones. My bone marrow started <laughs> going through tidal waves. The tide changed into my bone marrow saying, Brother Bear, you've got something here. You've got something in there. And I, the way that I kind of think about the Palmer, the way that he channels Hitchcock's language of suspense when it comes to filmmaking through his own impeccable technical prowess, he replaces those chaste moments in Hitchcock's films with utter grubby horniness. Full horn. Full horn. <laughs> Imagine. And especially it's like this smutty porno voyeurism that's in this one. And it's just like, when if you can embrace that and going through your list, I think you fucking can. Yeah, yeah. I think you'll get a lot out of Body Double. Yeah, I think, uh, I think you've made such a profoundly good choice here. I was really <laughs> thinking there was... Because I, it's funny because I thought I'd picked quite randomly... You know, I thought I'd just kind of gone, well, you know, Mulholland Drive's probably my favourite movie. I loved May Dece But I thought, this is a pretty eclectic mix. Mm. You thought you're putting the master through the test, but... But no. It was the Padawan that was run through the gauntlet. Wow. And and I'm also seeing a, a, a through line in my taste here. Mm. Zachy loves a, a camp Hollywood story with a noir <laughs> edge. <laughs> <laughs> Zachy certainly does. And I would say, Zoolander, you may be thinking, well, where's the noir edge there? Uh, it's a freaking investigation yeah, movie. Yeah, there's a big... And it gets deeper and deeper, it's wider deeper, and wider. It's a detective story. Detective Zoolander, Zoolander should have been the sequel. Zoolander is the Chinatown of our time. <laughs> Exploring a smutty side of Hollywood. 
<laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much, Alexi. This no is a worries. great choice. My pleasure. You know, you've got an overnighter, so come back tomorrow, drop that one back in the <laughs> chute. I'll be waiting there to catch it through that little hole in the door. No, you give me a fine and you'll never fucking see me again, oh, man. Fuck. I'm moving to Ballarat. What if I promise you half price <laughs> if you pay on the spot when you return? Oh, I'll think about oh, it. Oh, shit. Okay. And Zach, I'm going to extend you a little bit of an offer. You have worked in a video store before. Yeah. In hospitality, they call it a rock star shift when someone comes back to the industry for a little night. In this world, we call it a Tarantino. Oh, if you ever yeah. want to come to a Tarantino shift with me, join me on this side of the counter, eh, you're welcome to. Oh, uh, that would be a grand honor. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. yes, yes uh, thank yes. you, master. You're welcome, my dear son. You're welcome. <laughs> thank you, man. This has been a blast. And I recommend you listen to more episodes of the podcast. It's called The Last Video Store. We haven't really said the title out loud within the realm of the podcast. Yeah, I went to I went to call it the Batuta Video. But that's the name of the store. It's actually quite a world we've created here. <laughs> the Last Video Store. Well, 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 what a genius staff pick from me. Truly, like, actually freaking insane that it worked out that way. But it did. Uh, sometimes the Lord works in mysterious ways. And I'm the Lord of this podcast. Uh, let's get into Zach's picks. May, December, one of my favorite movies, is now newly available on VOD for rental on your Apple or whatever one you use. So check it out if you haven't already. It freaking rocks there's also a blu-ray in australia and it's not released on blu-ray anywhere else in the world so thank you very much to Vivision for doing that and road games all-time favorite of mine is on broly our friends at broly have got that streaming right now zoolander is on binge and paramount plus mulholland drive is stan and binge and the criterion channel if you're a subscriber also that new 4k from studio canal and criterion that disc oh my god brother it's a surrealist stream and body double my pick my little work of genius constructing that pick together is available on sbs on demand for freaking free dude or you can rent it on vod if you want to pay for it but you know just go on sbs on demand support public broadcasting online dude uh that is today's episode thank you to zachary ruain for joining me on the podcast and picking up those rentals i absolutely love you brother if you're listening to this personally this is a message directly to you zach i love you i cherish you and i can't wait to be your friend for the rest of our long lives together very long lives uh keep up with the podcast on instagram at last video store batuta and you'll get some exclusive clips and shit on there. <laughs> and then you can follow us and subscribe to us on YouTube to watch the podcast, to listen to the podcast on Spotify and Apple. Give us a five-star review. And I really appreciate it. And why don't you, in that review, tell us what your rental combo would be. And you know what? Maybe I'll get to it and actually tell you a customized recommendation directly to you. So until next time, Please keep spinning those discs and watching those beautiful movies. I love ya. I'm Alexi. <laughs>